Hi Lakewood Library, I'm Elise Colette Goldbach and I'm so excited to talk to you today about my book, Rust, A Memoir of Steel and Grit, which is about the time I spent working in the steel mill here in Cleveland. Now, if you're anything like me and you were born and bred in the Cleveland area, then you're probably already very familiar with the site of the steel mill. You can see it whenever you drive along 176 or 490, and you can even admire sections of the steel mill when you're shopping at Steelyard Commons. And the mill is a fixture here in Cleveland. It's a part of our heritage, but it's also not something that we often view with pride. Admittedly, the buildings look dirty and dingy and somewhat sinister. We think about pollution when we see the steam rising from the smokestacks. We wonder about that chimney near 490 that always belches an orange flame into the air. And even the, the soil beneath the steel mill can look gray and tired and worn. And to make matters worse, you never really see many people around when you're looking down at the mill from the highway. You don't see the steel workers who are operating the machinery or driving the forklifts or putting dolomite into the furnaces. You don't see people eating their lunches or doing crossword puzzles or warding off the exhaustion that comes when working the night shift. You just see these big massive buildings that are shooting out steam and, and you're putting orange flames up into the sky. And from when you look at it from that angle, the buildings of the mill almost seem like independent creatures that are chugging along all by themselves. The mill seems to have a life of its own, and sometimes it can be easy to forget about the people who are pulling the strings inside. Personally, I couldn't imagine what the steel mill was like until I got a job there. I never thought much about the steel workers inside those buildings, and I never thought that I would count myself among their numbers. You know, I did what every high school graduate is told to do. I went to college, I got my bachelor's degree, I eventually went on to study my master's in creative writing, and when I was finished with my schooling, I couldn't find a job anywhere. I, you know, applied for all different types of positions, but my resume always got turned down. The country was still recovering from the Great Recession at the time, and it seemed like Cleveland was recovering more slowly than other areas, and the job opportunities were few and far between. So for many years I worked as a house painter to make a living. The work was very seasonal. Um, I would bust my butt during the summer climbing ladders and scraping lead paint off of the sides of old houses, many of which were in Lakewood, and I would save my pennies for the winter when the work would inevitably dry up. You, know, you can't paint the outsides of houses in the cold, and people are often reluctant to get their living rooms redone during the holidays. So I would spend many weeks in the winter without a paycheck, just praying that my savings would hold. I also didn't have any health insurance at the time. I was technically a subcontractor, so the companies I worked with didn't offer any insurance, and I certainly didn't feel like I could afford to provide it for myself. So. My prospects were pretty grim and you know I was frustrated and a little forlorn and then I happened to meet up with an old friend of mine from my college days and he had just bought uh, his first house he had a brand new pickup truck in his driveway and he seemed to be doing really well for himself and we got to talking and I learned that he had landed a job in the steel mill and he encouraged me to imply and I shrugged off the suggestion at first. I couldn't imagine myself working in a steel mill, um, but my friend told me about the benefits that the mill offered. He showed me a copy of his paycheck, uh, which made my jaw drop. He was earning more money than I ever thought that I would make. And so I figured that it wouldn't uh, hurt to, to put my hat into the ring. Why not fill out one more application that will probably be turned down? But much to my surprise and delight, uh, I was called for an interview and I was eventually hired. Even though I had lived in the shadow of the steel mill for my entire life, nothing could have prepared me for what I encountered when I stepped inside. When you walk into the steel mill, it is like you are setting foot in a different world. 
first off, the mill is located in a valley, so you have to drive down this big, long, steep hill to get there. So right from the get-go, it feels like you're just descending into the unknown. Um, and when you land at the bottom of that hill, you're just impressed by the sheer size of everything. The buildings look really big and massive from the highway, but when you're standing at the foot of those buildings, they look even more enormous and more intimidating. And I mean, some of those buildings are so big that you could fit city blocks inside of them. You know, you could build houses inside the buildings of the steel mill. Some of them are these multi-level complex labyrinths of catwalks and elevator shafts and, and dead ends. And it is certainly not a place where you want to get lost because there are dangers around every corner. The cranes are always rumbling overhead, carrying giant pieces of steel that weigh, you know, tens of thousands of pounds. In some areas of the steel mill, there are rivers of iron that run on the ground as if you're stuck in the belly of hell itself. Um, in other areas, these huge vats of molten metal will sail through the air on occasion. Um, and pretty much everywhere you look, there is a huge machinery that can just rip your body apart without so much as a hiccup. And, you know, whenever I would look around that place, I would feel like um, I was a character in Gulliver's Tra Travels or Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Um, you know, I felt like a very small person scrambling through a world that had been built by giants. Except, of course, the steel mill wasn't built by giants. It was built by entrepreneurs in the early 20th century, and it has actually been in operation for more than 100 years. It's this living, breathing piece of Cleveland's history, and stories abound in the mill about you know, things that have happened there in the past. Some of the stories are funny and lighthearted, but um, some of them are also very scary and harrowing and tragic. And so I want to pause for a moment to do a short reading from the beginning of Rust, just to kind of put the mill and some of its stories into perspective for you. Steel is the only thing that shines in the belly of the mill. The walkways, which were once the color of jade, have dulled to a sickly, ashen green. The cranes, once yellow, have browned with grime. Dust settles on everything, on walls and fingers, on forklifts and lunches, on train cars and coat jackets. Even the workers who lumber through their long shifts seem to be collecting dust. I am one such worker. To the company, I'm known as number 6691, Utility. 6691 is a number given to new hires, greenies, fresh meat. When I first landed a job in the mill, one of the older employees congratulated me. You won the lottery, he said. You're going to make a lot of money. The man paused. He thought for a moment. He let out a long, tapered breath. Just be careful, he said. These machines will eat you up. On most days, the mill looks like a nightmare. A tall chimney shoots an orange flame into the early morning air. Smokestacks let out clouds of white steam. Train tracks divide the drained and dreary earth, and the brown water of the Cuyahoga River slogs toward the mouth of Lake Erie. Many of the buildings, which are covered in rust and soot, have taken on the blackish-red color of congealed blood. Inside those buildings, furnaces blaze and machinery churns and cranes screech under the weight of their loads. Inside those buildings, iron turns to steel. Billows of bright gas leap atop molten metal as it's poured into ladles standing upward of 30 feet tall. This leaping gas, which looks orange in the metal's glow, licks and whips in a devil's dance. Every inch of the mill is a screaming reminder. This is the kind of place that will kill you. This is the kind of place where people have died. On one of my first afternoons in the mill, an old-timer told me a story about a woman he had known. Like me, the woman was a utility worker. Like me, she probably felt grateful for her job in the mill. One day, the woman set her gloves on a steel table near a conveyor belt. It wasn't anything out of the ordinary. Everyone set their gloves on that same table. The conveyor belt chugged along, loaded with steel cylinders that weighed 20 or 30 tons. On that particular day, the cylinders on the conveyor belt had been heavily coated in oil. The steel was particularly slick, and the conveyor belt tended to shudder when it moved. Just as the woman reached for her gloves, 
one of the cylinders slipped from the conveyor belt and pinned her body against the steel table. Imagine it, the old timer said to me. The weight of that steel, it just split her in half. I didn't know what to say. I imagined my own body being crushed. She was still alive after it happened, the old timer said. That was the worst part. She was still alive. Get it off me, she kept saying. Get it off me. Get it off me. I looked down at my dirty hands. The grit of the mill seemed to bore its way into the creases on your palms. It got right down into your skin. When they finally got that steel off her, the, the old timer said, she died instantly. The man paused and stared into empty air. He seemed to be looking at something very far away. Her body, he said, her body just fell apart. Even now, when I think back on that story, it just gives me chills. I'm so devastated for what that woman went through, devastated for her family and for her friends. And every year as a steel worker, I would gather together with my fellow union employees and we would host a workers memorial day where we remembered the lives of people who had fallen victim to the steel industry. And it was a day of reverence and remembrance and respect. Um, and it was also a day of unity, and I remember just being very affected by the scene of so many steel workers coming together to make sure that the, the stories of, of people who had come before us weren't forgotten. And, you know, before I started as a steel worker, I didn't really think much about the dangers of the job. I knew that working in a steel mill was hazardous. I think that we all kind of know that in the back of our heads but I didn't really understand what that meant in a personal or visceral way. Um, but it quickly became apparent in my first few weeks on the job that you know, I would be working with things that could kill me, which really made me second guess my decision to become a steel worker. You know, what if something happened to me? Was this job really worth the risk to my life? In the end though, um, I didn't feel like I had many other options. I could either continue on as a steel worker or I could go back to a life of, you know, poverty and uncertainty. So, you know, I think it's Joan Didion who says, everything worth having has its price. For steel workers, the price of making a good living involves a risk of harm. Um, but I don't think that you have to work in an industry where you face mortal danger in order to relate to that. Um, you know, you don't have to operate heavy machinery or you don't have to stare at pieces of steel day in and day out. Um, I think more and more in America, uh, making a living can kind of cost us our lives. You know, people are working two or three jobs just to put food on the table or pay their student loans. We're, you know, living paycheck to paycheck, hoping that we don't get laid off. We're dealing with the financial repercussions of a pandemic and we're making really meager wages um, while the bank accounts of billionaires get bigger and bigger. And I think most of us would agree that income inequality is a, a huge problem in this country. You know, most of us know that um, the chasm between the rich and the rest of us is an issue that desperately needs to be solved in a way that is fair and just for everyone, especially for communities of color. We all know that people are getting rich off our backs while wages remain relatively stagnant. And yet it feels like the country has never been more divided. So one of my main motivations in writing Rest was to explore the attitudes that are keeping Americans at odds with one another. I began my tenure as a steel worker shortly before the 2016 election when everyone started looking at the Rust Belt and wondering why it had turned red. And I was asking myself those same questions and I felt like I had a really unique perspective. I was a liberal woman with a college education who had been raised by very conservative parents and I also happened to be a steel worker. So in many ways Rust is you know, about exploring the conservative ideologies that played such an important role in my childhood, but that I eventually moved away from. Um, and, you know, in my experience, I found that those ideologies are filled with a lot of anger. There is, you know, intolerance and outright animosity. And, 
but mostly those ideologies are, are filled with a lot of fear, you know, fear of difference, fear of other people, fear of change, fear of not having enough. And even now it feels like people are fawning over political leaders and media personalities who just want to enslave us with paranoia and anxiety. And people are being told that you know, liberals are just a bunch of pricks who are totally disconnected from the struggles of the middle class. And so Rust, in some way, is, is an attempt to poke holes at that narrative. You know, I was a steel worker. I worked the overtime. I slogged through the long shifts. I understand some of the issues and dangers that people in these industries face, uh, because sometimes the myth of the out-of-touch liberal is a lie. At the same time, however, Rust is also about chronicling the lives of industrial workers for people who think they've got us pegged. Um, I've seen a lot of media reports about factory workers, and it always seems like they choose to interview the most bumbling people from the crowd. You know, inevitably, these short news stories don't really capture the diversity of people and experiences that exist in places like the steel mill. And so Rust is an attempt to document the lives of people who often get misrepresented. It's, you know, a celebration of the Rust Belt and a celebration of Cleveland in particular. Cleveland is a city after my own heart, uh, but it's often the subject of criticism and ridicule. Just the other day I was um, teaching writing to undergraduate students and I was using a really well-known textbook to do so. And in this textbook, the author talks about some of the struggles that beginning writers face, one of which is this feeling that, you know, you haven't experienced anything important enough to write about. You know, it's that feeling that, that your life just isn't interesting enough to document. And so in this discussion about uninteresting lives, the author, of course, feels the need to invoke the Midwest. Um, you know, she talks about these poor beginning writers who might live in uninteresting places like what she calls the banal and utterly predictable world of Cleveland, Ohio. Now, granted, the, the author insinuates that Cleveland is not as banal and predictable as it might seem on the surface, but, you know, the reference raised my hackles just the same. Um, you know, why does America always turn to Cleveland when it wants to make a joke? So I want to pause to do another uh, quick reading that might give you some more insight into my strong feelings about Cleveland, Ohio. When I was 28 years old and months away from starting at the mill, I was still living on the outskirts of Cleveland. I had rented the only one bedroom I could afford, an apartment that smelled like dead animals. It came with ugly burgundy carpeting and a mouse problem, which my landlord had remedied with poison. Now there were dead mice festering in my walls, so I decided to pack a bag and visit my best friend in Washington, D.C. When I arrived at her place for the weekend, we went out and drank whiskey with two men she'd met in the city. The men were both lawyers on the fast track, and they seemed curious about my Cleveland heritage. So, one of the lawyers said, his thick brown hair was slicked back with just the right amount of gel. What does Cleveland produce? What do you mean, I said. You know, he told me, Maine's got lobsters, Hawaii's got coffee, Virginia's got peanuts. What about Cleveland? What comes out of Cleveland? The man's question reeked of sarcasm. It was less of a question and more of a challenge. I dare you to find something important that comes out of Cleveland, Ohio. I sipped my whiskey and thought for a moment. I didn't know what to say. What did Cleveland produce? What made us important? What separated us from the rest? I couldn't think of anything, so I did what Clevelanders do best. I made a joke. What comes out of Cleveland, I said? Failure. The joke got a good laugh. I laughed, too. It's too bad that you got stuck in such a dead-end city, the lawyer said. My fist tightened around my glass of whiskey. There's an unspoken rule among Clevelanders. Those who've been born and bred in the city can joke about its blunders, but outsiders had better keep their mouths shut. Listen, I said, you don't know shit about Cleveland. The man looked surprised, almost amused. We have all kinds of shit you don't even know about, I told him, desperate for the right words. We have the orchestra and the art museum and the lake. We have the fucking Cleveland Clinic. 
The man took a long sip of whiskey. No doubt he was trying to discern whether or not I was joking. Truth is, he had struck a nerve. I felt torn about my city, my home, my heritage. I did feel stuck in Cleveland, but I also recognized the beauty of my hometown. It's a city nicknamed the Mistake on the Lake. It's an underdog town marked by a spirit of dogged perseverance. Its people have a unique breed of gritty optimism in the face of dire odds. Before I went to the work at the mill, though, it had never occurred to me that I didn't know shit about Cleveland either. My hometown was more than just a city of blunders, but I didn't realize it as I talked to those lawyers from D.C. My half-baked defense had failed to persuade anyone, because I was only seeing half of the picture. I couldn't possibly defend Cleveland's spirit until I learned to appreciate its orange flame. In a Rust Belt town, the flame from the steel mill isn't just a harbinger of weird smells and pollution. It isn't an anachronism, and it doesn't prove a lack of innovation. While people in cities like San Francisco or Boston might think of the orange flame as an embarrassment, it's something more than that to us. It's jobs and tax dollars. It indicates a thriving economy. If that flame is burning, steelworkers say, then it means that Cleveland is doing all right. The flame is very much a part of our history and our identity. It's a steady reminder that some things can stand the test of time, even in a world where nothing is built to last. So at the end of the day, I felt like the steel mill taught me more about my hometown than I had learned in a lifetime of living here, but the knowledge wasn't gained overnight. You know, you have to earn your way into the union. You have to earn your stripes as a steel worker. Um, when I first started out in the mill, I was given an orange hard hat to wear. Now, only new employees wore orange hard hats, which stuck out like sore thumbs in the mill. You could see an orange hard hat coming from miles away, and you always thought the same thing. You know, you would think, oh, there goes a newbie. Um, the veteran workers who had been in the mill for a while all wore yellow hard hats, much like this one. And you had to earn the privilege of wearing one of these. Um, until then, you were referred to by a simple name that signified your lowly status. Everyone just called you an orange hat. Uh, but the name wasn't meant to be an insult. You know, it didn't matter what color hard hat you wore. Steel workers always looked out for each other. And, you know, so much of Rust is about the journey that I took to get the yellow hard hat. And... You know, during that time, I worked a lot of strange and interesting jobs, and I learned a lot about the steelmaking process, and I became immersed in the culture of the union. And more than anything, though, I, I felt like I met people in the mill who affected me deeply. Um, you know, working in this job is difficult. It's hot, it's loud, it's grimy. Um, the shifts are really long and tiring, and there are dangers around every corner. And I don't know that I would have gotten through it without the help of my fellow steel workers. You know, they ended up teaching me lessons about life, and lessons about myself, and lessons about America. And, you know, they turned me into a stronger and more resilient version of myself. And my experience of the steel mill wouldn't have been the same without them. So I want to close on a little reading from my first few weeks in the mill. Um, I attended an orientation with a bunch of other orange hats. And at the end of that orientation, we were given some hands-on training by a guy named Jack, who had been in the steel mill for decades. You know, he was hardened and stoic and, you know, he was something of a character. And so this reading is a little... Um, Thing that I will always remember about him. As the person in charge of everything related to boom lifts, Jack took me and a small group of orange hats to a massive warehouse on the south side of the mill. The building could have held several mansions inside, and a cool breeze was coming from an open truck dock. In the cavernous space, I felt like a ball of dust blowing slowly across the floor. A thin tarp had been draped from the ceiling to divide one side of the building from the other, and I didn't envy the person who put it up there. The ceiling was at least four stories high, and the fabric was torn in places. The dim fluorescent lights cast haunting shadows over the whole scene. It looked like something out of a horror film, and I could almost imagine a serial killer slashing through the tarp with a big bloodied knife. 
Jack led us through a big hole in the fabric and stopped in an area of the building that felt like a land of forgotten parts. Random tools sat on abandoned tables, as if the person wielding them had suddenly disappeared. Huge pieces of machinery had been scattered across the floor. There were shafts that no one wanted. There were gears with nothing to grind. You could find kinked cables and rusty bolts, and every so often you stumbled upon an oily pair of gloves. I waited with the other orange hats while Jack rifled through a twisted pile of safety harnesses. When he had finally freed a harness from its knots, he turned to us with an air of authority. This is how you put the harness on, Jack said, buckling himself into a bright blue contraption that went around his legs and shoulders. Just make sure it's not too loose, he said. Um, how loose is too loose, one of the other orange hats said. If you fall out of it, it's too loose. When Jack handed me my harness, I tightened it as much as I could. For the rest of the morning, he took each of the orange hats up into a boom lift individually, and I watched as the first few people had their turns. The lift was a truck-like contraption attached to a long, articulating arm. When operating the lift, you stood inside a basket that was fixed to the end of the arm. From there, you could drive the lift like a vehicle. You could turn in tight circles or go in reverse. Or you could do what the boom lift was intended to do. With the right combination of levers, the articulating arm would extend upward and raise you into the air, allowing you to reach great heights without a ladder. With a boom lift, mechanics and electricians could reach precarious positions in relative safety, mostly for the purpose of fixing cranes. That's the reason Jack was running the class. He worked as a maintenance man in a department called Crane Repair. When it was finally my turn, Jack showed me the power switch and explained how to check the boom lift for damage. Then we both climbed into the basket and clipped our harnesses to a rail. These are the controls that bring the boom lift up, he said. Go on, give it a try. I pressed the levers that Jack showed me and the articulating arm started to move. Our little basket climbed into the air. It rose 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet and more. Take it as high as it'll go, Jack said. The basket was starting to wobble, and the world below was looking smaller and smaller. I don't know exactly where we stopped, but we were high enough that a fall would have been fatal. While my harness was theoretically there to stop me from hitting the ground, I wasn't eager to try it out. See this lever, Jack asked. Yeah, I said secretly, hoping that the lever would bring us back down to the ground. This lever tilts the basket forward, Jack told me. I wondered why anyone would want to tilt the basket forward. Give it a try, he said. Tip it as far as you can handle. The basket shuddered when I pressed the lever, and Jack must have seen a worried look flash across my face. Don't worry, he said. That's normal. I wasn't so sure, but I kept pressing the lever anyway. The basket began to pitch forward, and it wasn't long before I was struck with vertigo. It felt like I was going to tumble right off the side, so I looked over at Jack to see if I had gone far enough. Keep going, he said, laughing maniacally. His eyes had grown wide with excitement and his mouth was twisted into the gaping smile of a madman. Keep going, show me that you've got what it takes to be a steel worker. Jack chuckled to himself. It seemed that the pitch in the basket had made him completely deranged, but I was too afraid of falling to take much notice. I've always had an immense fear of heights ever since I was a child. Back when I worked as a house painter, it took me years to tackle anything taller than a six-foot ladder. I refused to walk on roof lines, and my heart beat wildly whenever I climbed higher than a few feet. As I tipped the basket of the boom lift forward, I looked up at the ceiling. I knew that a small group of orange hats was watching from the ground, but I would have lost my nerve if I looked down and tried to find them. Later that day, I talked with the other orange hats and learned that Jack had done the same trick with all of us. He wanted everyone to tip the basket as far as it would go, as if this were a sacred rite of initiation. He wanted to make sure that we had what it took to work inside the mill. In truth, I wasn't sure that I did have what it would take to be a steel worker. I didn't bleed, bleed iron as Jack surely did, and rust didn't cling to my bones. I'd spent my whole life in Cleveland, but I'd learned about the mill from the sidelines. I read about the Rust Belt in books and magazines. I heard about it from pundits and economics professors. And I'd come to believe that the Rust Belt was the collection of tidy metaphors that everyone else wanted it to be. Come on, Jack shouted. Don't stop. I kept pressing the controls and the basket kept tilting forward. 
It was the spring of 2016, and Donald Trump was making his climb to the presidency. In a matter of months, reporters would be looking at the Rust Belt and scratching their heads. The basket was pitched at a precipitous angle, and Jack just cackled. Keep going, he howled. I didn't want Jack to call me soft or yellow, which seemed like the kind of thing he was liable to say, so I tilted the basket even more. I would keep going, even if I wanted to puke. I would learn how to make steel, even if it wasn't the job I had envisioned for myself. And I would finally learn how to answer those smug lawyers in Washington, D.C. If they came up to me today and asked what Cleveland produces, I would know what to say. Steel. Steel comes out of Cleveland. Tons and tons of steel. It's not sexy. It's not exotic. It's dirty and hot and loud, but somebody has to do it. We feed the appliance industry and we supply the auto industry. We make the types of steel that will be transformed into frames and innards and underbellies. We make the strong stuff, the trip grades, the dual phase steels, the HSLA steel. We make the types of steel that don't collapse under pressure. What we make isn't glamorous, but it keeps you safe. What we make isn't fancy, but it keeps you moving. I can't do any more, I called to Jack as I eased off the controls. My heart was beating wildly, and my sweaty hands were clinging desperately to the sides of the basket. Jack, on the other hand, was completely calm. He wasn't sweating or breathing heavily, and he didn't have a look of terror on his face. He might as well have been enjoying a picnic at the park. That was pretty damn good for a first-timer, he said with a smile. Now bring us back down. I just want to thank you all for tuning in and listening. Um, I hope you had a good time. If you're from Lakewood or Cleveland, then I hope that you can find some things that resonate for you in the pages of Rust. If you're not from Northeast Ohio or if you haven't been here for long, then hopefully the book can warm your heart to this place and its people. So thank you again for your interest and I hope you all stay safe and well.